Hi, Hi. Jesse, I lived at the 92nd Street Y last year while you guys were filming Fleischmann. So like seeing you used to be like a part of my morning routine. It was so fun. My apology, apologies for the elevator. I heard we caused- <laughs> No, it's okay. Oh. It's nice. We all got workouts. We got to use the stairs. It was great. Oh, I was gonna say she took the stairs. Okay, so I was like yeah. friends with a guy who does programming at the, at the thing. And he wrote me an email while I was like working on the show, working 14 hours. And he was like, um, it's causing yeah. a real problem with the elevator. <laughs> yeah. like, I'm, I'm not in charge of I think I, I came downstairs in my pajamas one day and I saw cameras. So I was like, oh no. Sorry about but that. But it was, it was a lot Is of fun. Cool we all, we I, didn't know you could, I didn't know you could live with an This one you can. Yeah. yeah, it's college housing. It's really cool. It was it was really fun. There was like all these different anemones. There was like a studio. We love to just like explore the hallways. It was really Are you fun. You going to like drama school or something? Uh, yeah, I go to like journalism school. Um, journalism, I go to because a my friends Hunter, who work through so. drama. Yeah, okay. it was is a that where they, is, it, is it the same 90 Circuit and Street where they do all the panels and talks? That's exactly it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we got to go to them for free, which was really cool. That is awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. a really, really awesome place to live. So let's talk about the movie. Um, <laughs> this is, first of all, congratulations to you both. This is one of the greatest things I've seen in my entire life. I'm amazed. Oh, thank you so um, much. Of course. Jesse, in your original audio drama for this project, you explored three different changes in time. What was the inspiration behind choosing this particular time period for the film? Well, I started writing from the perspective of a father who had a newborn baby um, and couldn't emotionally connect to this child. And it took place in the year 2017, and because um, that's when I started writing it. And um, as I was writing it, I thought, God, it would be so interesting. So I, the story ended just naturally of this guy thinking about his kid growing up. Mm -hmm. And he had this kind of like emotional revelation about, you know, all the flaws he has as a dad might not transfer to his kid. And so it ended that way. And I thought, God, wouldn't it be able, wouldn't it be amazing to see what this kid is grows like? Grows up to be. Yeah, grows up to be. And it coincided with this um, um, presidential candidate, Andrew Yang, running for president when I was starting to write this section. And he was talking about what's happening in the future, the ch changes in, in work. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to set it in 2032, 15 years after, and see automation take hold, and see a kid try to make a living in the new world. And what would that be? And it would be something like him playing music if he's an artist but only online and him having absolutely no purchase no popularity no interest from people in school and how weird that might be um and um and then just briefly the third section of the book was to go back 30 years to 2003 and see uh 2002 and see the story from the mother's perspective um and that's the part that julianne moore plays but in the audiobook she's 18. um and then um so anyway this is all to say that i had written these characters at great length and when i was finished with the audiobook i thought um it'd be wonderful to kind of flesh out the story of this young man and his mother and see the world from his mother's perspective too because they are really a clash of cultures and ethics you know, he's this kind of shallow capitalist who's actually quite a good singer, but who only has interest in making money. And his mother is a social justice activist who runs a domestic violence shelter. And uh, I thought it'd be so interesting to put these people in the same house and see how they try to coexist in a way that feels completely untenable. I love it so much, Finn. You're amazing, Julianne. That contrast is so beautiful. Now, Finn, you and Ziggy share a passion. You both have this passion for music. What was it like to combine music and acting in this performance? I really thought you were going to say, you and Ziggy are exactly the same. <laughs> so what is that like? No, 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 no. no. Um, I, uh, yeah, no, I, th I thought, again, yeah, that's just one of the great things that I w was given to kind of as an, as an actor because I don't know, the more things you find similar with the character, the more, the easier it is to play. And so that that was one of the things that I thought, you know, made it uh, actually very comfortable for me was um, also being able to kind of uh, play this character also through a lens of someone that, that enjoys, you know, playing music and, and loves music and actually thinks that, like, the character thinks that you, in a lot of ways that music is the answer completely, which is kind of a, a ridiculous sentiment, but I think is is also, I actually, I understand uh, to to a, another, you know, uh, to a different degree, but I think I completely understand where he's coming from. Um, but as far as playing the music goes, I, yeah, it was just fun. Yeah, it's very fun. Finn is a genius musician. He's being humble. Finn is a brilliant <laughs> musician. He also happens to be a great improviser in music, which is, you know, doubly difficult. And so we would, just throw him uh, um, prompts on set. Finn, I need you to just think, sing 30 seconds of a song about July 4th weekend. And he comes up with some hysterically funny, brilliant, fully fledged idea uh, on the spot. The, the, the difficulty was making Finn less 
talented and rich than he is because the character is not as talented as Finn actually is and the character is more shallow than what Finn writes. And so um, the challenge was like, you know, normally on a movie, and I've done movies where I have a skill set. I did a, you know, I play magician, a magician in these movies, and like, you know, I, I'm like completely inept with a deck of cards, and you hope that the actors could just learn 30 seconds of a skill so they can perform. And this was the exact opposite. We were trying to take this wonderful musician and make him look kind of like clumsy and a little shallow. Well, I also felt like. So I had a lot of experience, kind of in the in the shallow uh, music writing world. So I, to me, it was actually it was when you for were real. 10? Well, no, but I mean, just in writing songs, you just I don't you know go through weird periods. Yeah, yeah. Even now, like at any time now, I mean, I just I will, will be stuff. But uh, yeah, no, I, I I yeah, I don't know. I just I thought it was again. It's the same thing where I I just like I felt like there was an immense amount of trust put in me which i i thought was so um yeah it just made me feel very good and also terrified at the same time um because i was like oh man i hope i don't mess this up but i i it ended up yeah working out okay you guys are so much fun to talk to i want to stay here all day but sadly i can't so um thank you so so much for being for joining me today and i am again amazed with this film i'm so excited for people to see it thank you so much thank you, Guys, have a good rest of your day. See you, you too. Hey, Billy. Hey, Alicia. How are you? Hi, Hi. How are you? Okay, you can uh, dive right in. So, Alicia, you play a character who's very passionate about seeing change in this world, which I think is so beautiful. What do you hope that viewers can learn from Lila when they see this film? Um, I think I think Lila is a reflection of of people or teenagers her age right now. So I feel like people who are 16, 17 are probably the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And I feel very dumb when I talk to them because they are so socially aware and so socially active and they care so deeply about things that are so far away from them in their own world. So um, I feel like if there were, they were to learn anything, but I feel like they kind of, Lila reflects that. I think maybe just um, finding true passion about things that, uh, mean something to you and do work behind it and if and lead with passion in that way. Billy, your performance is so beautiful because you see this character that we don't know a ton about and you can very much tell from his interactions that he has this bright demeanor, but there is a lot of stuff going on. Um, what was your preparation process like to play him and what did you learn about him in the process? I, I felt like all of that was really in the script. I felt that the character had this I really just liked the way that he carried himself despite of you know in spite of his sort of like life experiences and um I sort of I don't know I didn't I didn't quite know what to do so I, I sort of just like locked myself in my parents basement and watched like movies from Indiana I watched like documentaries that took place in Indiana I like was like maybe I'm to do a voice and I thought I'm not gonna do an accent because I can't do that um but I I really felt like the the script was so strong and working with Jesse and working with Julianne, I kind of feel like I didn't have to do all that much. And and I think that it was, it was really just nice to, to sort of show up and just try and be present and, and listen and, and work with Julianne and, and the character's a little bit more passive. So I think it kind of helped, helped me uh, in, in my process, but I, I felt it was all there on the script. A film written and directed by Jesse Eisenberg. It's such a special project. It is, again, brilliant, you guys. It's one of the best things that I've seen all year, last year. It was wow. just so beautiful. Congratulations. What was it like to just work with him and to be a part of it? Uh, yeah, I was really, I was so excited and so intimidated because I'm a fan of Jesse's and I never met him before. And I was just so happy that he wanted me to be in this film that was personal to him as well and um yeah he was incredible to work with he's probably one of the my favorite directors I've worked with and yeah yeah definitely I was I feel the same way I'm such a big fan of Jesse's that I had really no idea what to expect and I really liked the script and I just wanted to do a good job and then he called me for the first time and we just talked about basketball and he's a huge <laughs> basketball fan and it really just sort of everything every idea that I had or any nerves I just kind of went away and we spent a lot of time talking about basketball, which was, which was nice for me. It was a nice. It was, What's it was your favorite a, team? What's the Raptors, the Toronto Raptors? Oh yeah, yeah. makes sense. Yeah, I'm from Canada. Go Raptors. <laughs> Billy, 
you and Finn sort of live parallel lives in this film. You just co-directed Hell of a Summer together, which is so exciting. So excited to see that. Despite it being so much about the both of you, you really only have that one interaction in the school. What was filming that moment like? That was that was a ton of fun. I, I felt uh, that was my first day shooting. And I think that they sort of planned it that way. So Finn and I could shoot together on my first day. Uh, and it was a really, really cool experience to kind of be working separately from him and then getting to see the film afterwards and and see all the work he was doing. And I, I'm just really proud of him. I think he's great in the movie and he's one of my best friends. And I think that people are really going to like him in the movie. But yeah, it's a cool thing where our characters sort of don't cross paths and, and they do for a, a split second there. And I, I really like that moment in the film. Um, but yeah, we didn't we didn't really work together too much on this one, which I thought was cool.